Today I'm going to be doing an acrylic painting demonstration of a peacock. I almost called you a flamingo. You're not a flamingo. Hi, I'm Lisa, the artist behind La Cree Fine Art. Today I am working on a Frederick's Convexo canvas. These canvases have a beveled edge. They're pretty thick, so you're going to paint all the way around the edge and you hang them just as is. You don't need to put these in a frame. And just for transparency, I am sponsored by Frederick's. They do supply me with my canvases, which works out great because they were the only canvases that I used anyway. Now for these ones, the Convexo canvases, they have a little bit more tooth. They're a little bit rougher than what I like for painting fine detail, and especially if I'm going to airbrush like I did on the background here. So what I did is take some gesso, put a coat of gesso over the entire thing, I let it dry completely, and then I took some sandpaper and just sanded it down so that it was a very smooth surface. And that made it more like a blue label canvas, which you guys know I love to paint on. So now I have a nice smooth surface, which is much better for airbrushing, because airbrushing we want a very smooth surface, and for a lot of the fine detail that I did around the head. And I'll have links to everything I used below in the video description. Make sure to stay tuned till the end of the video where I am going to varnish this so you can see how much richer these colors look once there's a gloss varnish on it. If you are supporters over on Patreon, head over there where the one and a half hour version of this tutorial, complete with some real time clips, so you can really see how I'm moving that brush, is available for you now. If you are not supporters over on Patreon, you can sign up for as little as $4 a month, which gives you access to all of the videos I've ever uploaded over at Patreon, which is somewhere over a hundred one to two hour long tutorials. I will have a link to that in the video description as well. So after adding the gesso and sanding the canvas down, I painted it a dark charcoal gray. Then I sketched my, my I wanted to call him a flamingo, my peacock out onto tracing paper. And the reason that I do it onto the tracing paper first is that way any erasing and smudging and adjustments can be made there while keeping my canvas perfectly clean. Now I'm taking my piece of transfer paper, this is by Low Cornell, and a stylus and just sketching over everything I already drew. This way, again, like I said, my canvas is kept perfectly clean. I don't have all of the smudges and eraser marks that I would have on the tracing paper. So I draw draw everything out and once I've sketched over everything and you can see my transfer paper doesn't need to be big I rip it down into a smaller section and just adjust it as needed I just want to make sure that my tracing paper is taped down so that doesn't slide around and screw up my actual outline but here everything is drawn out so now I'm ready to start painting and I'm going to start with an airbrush and a circle template I'm just using black and white airbrush paint from a Holbein and this just goes right over my nice smooth background. And this is one of the reasons that it was so important for me to have such a smooth background, knowing I was going to be using the airbrush. The airbrush generally looks better on a very smooth surface than it does something that's more textured. I just layered the white on there where I wanted it. And then I'm gonna come back through with the black airbrush paint and darken a few areas up. Starting with that dark charcoal gray, it just gave me a nice mid-range area to start with. And then I could go lighter and darker from there. Once I get that done, I'm ready to start painting my peacock. I still keep wanting to call him a flamingo. You can tell I paint too many flamingos. So I'm starting with a liner brush. This is a number one synthetic hog haired liner brush and I'm painting with unbleached titanium white. I don't wanna go straight white here because if I go already, if I start out that bright, I'm not gonna be able to go brighter from there. So here with the unbleached titanium white, it's more of a cream color and it makes it very easy for me to get my white highlights that you'll see me add on later. I'm just loosely blocking in some of the details here. There is some water mixed in with my paint. If you're unfamiliar with how to get fine lines with a liner brush, I do have a video showing you how to do that. I will have a card pop up so you can check that out. I'm loosely painting in about where these tuft of feathers are going to go on the ends of these. I don't need them to be perfect, just need to be close. Once that is done, I'm coming through with a reddish brown tone to darken some of these up. And now I've got my teal color that I mixed phthalo blue and phthalo green to get, and then a bright aqua green color on top of that. That bright aqua green, all of these are Liquitex basics, by the way. The bright aqua green is a more opaque color, so I can go on top of darker areas and have it still stand out very well. With the phthalo blue and phthalo green, those are my more translucent colors, so they blend really nicely into the background, but they don't stand out that much. If I need those colors to stand out a lot, I need to put something opaque underneath them and then I can put that color on top. I'm leaving these little sketchy kind of straight lines to create the look of the feathers on the tip of these. 
And the main colors I'm using here are phthalo blue, phthalo green, and the bright aqua, or bright aqua green, I believe it's called. So while that dries, I'm gonna start painting in the eye. I've got a reddish brown color. This is my red oxide. And I'm going around the edges with my gray and some unbleached titanium white. My base layers, they're just blocking in the color. I don't need anything to be perfect. I'm just going to layer until it starts to look good. This is not something where you have to expect your first layer to look the way you want your end result to be. Just getting a general idea of where the lights and darks will go. And nothing that I have done he here is actually complete. I've got a lot of layering to go. There is the finished result of the head off to the side there. You can see this is going to take a lot of layers to get to that end goal. And that's okay. One of the things that is so common to have happen when you're starting a painting is you get very overwhelmed. You look at something and go, how am I going to get to that end product? You know, my first few layers, these, this looks terrible. I'm not doing a good job. I should just start over. It is normal for those first few layers to look terrible. They shouldn't look good yet. I'd actually be a little bit concerned or kind of wondering what you're doing if the, the first layers, when you're, you're building up layers like this, if your first layers, they're just not going to look like that finished product. So don't get frustrated with that. Now I'm adding that bright aquamarine, or I keep saying bright aquamarine, it's bright aqua green is the color that I'm using there. And I'm creating the hint of where feathers are going to go. All of that is going to get covered. I mean, as you can see, comparing with my finished painting, those colors, not the same. There, It's got a long way to go until I get to that end result. And as I paint in these details in the skin under the eye here, I don't need this to be exact to my reference photo. And this reference photo, by the way, comes from wildlifereferencephotos.com. So if you want to paint this exact, I still want to call him a flamingo, peacock, you can head over there and pick that up. You can see adding some highlights in here. And I just keep layering and layering and layering. This is a not a fast process. I mean, semi-fast in that it's acrylic, it dries quick so I can get it done very quickly. But I mean, it's not something where two brush strokes in any given area is going to be done. Now I'm glazing my phthalo blue to darken some of these areas up, letting some of the bright aqua green show through. I'm gonna let that dry, and while that is drying, I'm going to move onto the beak, and the same thing, just gonna start by blocking it out. I mean, if you look at this area here, that is very different than what the end result is going to be. I'm just going to layer and layer until it looks how I want it to. And I started with a more mid-range gray tone, and that way I could build lights and darks from there. It gives me a, a really good kind of starting point to go lighter and darker. And all of the white that you're seeing me use right now is actually the unbleached titanium white. I saved the titanium white, my brightest white, just for my highlights. I'm starting to pull some of this orange in here. And this orange is kind of funny. It's called red something or cadmium red light hue, I believe. And it is extremely translucent. And I normally don't use it. Like if I'm painting a clownfish, I'm typically going to switch over to oranges from my heavy body or soft bodied Liquitex paints. But I'm finding the more that I use this for glazing, I am loving this translucent orange. As useless as it is when I want a really opaque orange, it is perfect when I want just that tint. And so lately, I've been using that color on so many things. It's funny how you just have to figure out what a certain color or what a certain type of paint works best for because different ones will work better for different techniques. Whereas the heavy body, the more opaque paints, I like for certain other things um, like that bright orange where I would want a more opaque color on certain projects. I've got some purple in that beak too and I'm also pulling a lot of magenta into the eye and into the beak using a liner brush and going on top of some of my feathers with that bright aqua green again. The difference here is I'm not covering all of the lighter, that lighter blue or well, it's kind of a medium blue I have there. I want some of that to show through as well. So I'm taking this bright aqua green and kind of hitting the tips or the edges of those. This way I have multiple colors showing on each little feather clump. Technical term there in case you were wondering. 
Now with these feathers, like I always say, I don't sit and count, you know, 15 feathers going this way, 14 going the other direction. I just want to create the te same texture that my reference photo has. I don't need every single feather to be exact in order to create a very realistic looking painting. So this might, with all of these feathers, they're close, but not exact. I do want to make sure that they're going in the right direction though. That is important. So as we move on to the neck, again off to the left, that is my finished painting so you can see what my end goal was. And I am taking that bright aqua green, which is fairly opaque, but you can still see through the black that, or the dark charcoal color I have underneath a little bit. So it's not going to be as vivid as my end result is. My goal at this point is to create the texture of feathers. I will tint the colors later by glazing. That's not a big deal. And if you don't understand the concept of glazing, I do have a video really breaking that down. I'll have a card pop up so you can check that out. But here I'm I'm using a Filbert rake brush. This one is by Low Cornell. It's a one quarter inch. And with this brush, I'm using, I'm able to get several little teeny tiny brush strokes with one brush stroke because the rake brush, the bristles are kind of spread out. So it gives me a very soft, very natural look with a lot of these feathers. Depending on how I hold and move this brush, it can work just like a normal filbert if I have a lot of paint loaded on it. Or if I have less paint, it works more like the rake brush where I get several brush strokes with that one actual brush stroke. And I just want to create these clumps and clusters. Do not care at all about the color at this point. And I do come through, I'll start coming through with my highlights. But again, my color, as you can see, is nowhere near what my end result is going to be. Switching directions when I get to these feathers here. Just again, building my clumps and clusters. Coming through now with some of these highlights. So now I've got the lighter and dark areas, which is going to look better if I get those in now before I start glazing in all of my other colors. Now here I'm coming through with my phalo blue. One of the ways that I'm going to create a sort of jewel tone look is to use colors of blue or two different tones of blue that I feel clash. Cool blue and warm blue. I'm mixing the two together. So here now I've switched to a cool blue. I've added purple to my blue. So that is purple and phalo blue, which is a very, very cool blue. Added that and then I came back through or I will come back through later on with blue that has phalo blue or phalo green mixed in with it, which is a very warm green, warm blue. Wow, words are hard. But that those colors seem to fight against each other almost. And those being up against each other really create that very jeweled shiny look that I'm going for along with a few other tricks that I'll show you later on. So as I move on to this next section, all I'm doing is blocking in the general location of where my lights and darks go, where the, the orange feathers or peach feathers are going to go versus the more purple and blue colors. Now this whole area, actually this whole bird in general, I hyped up my color saturation quite a bit from what my reference photo was. I wanted these colors to be much, much more bold. So my goal at this point is just to get a general idea. Where do my oranges go? Where do my blues go? Once I get all of that blocked in, I can come through and start cleaning up detail, refining things. And then back to the head and the neck, that still has a long ways to go. I'm just letting that dry after my last glaze and blocking these in. And you can see even here, I mean, where I'm always talking about, when you have something that doesn't look quite how you want, it doesn't mean it's wrong, it just means it's not finished. And this stage is a great example of that. Watch as it continues to build up how I start getting those more jeweled tones, where I start cleaning up the feathers and making it all look much more realistic. And for these little details, I am mixing my violet in with black. At no point, all of the darkest blacks that you see on this one, none of them are flat black. I wanted, other than the background, I wanted the bird himself to have just these really bold, very bright colors. And I wanted a lot of depth in those black areas. So the black areas are actually a mixture of violet or purple and my black. And it makes them seem so much darker than if I had gone with a straight flat black. It gives me a lot more depth, but all of these little details that I'm adding into these feathers, those are also being done with that same combination of violet and black or purple and black. Now I'm coming through adding some highlights on top of those details. And back onto the bird. Here I'm coming back through now with a, it's a bright yellow green. It's almost a fluorescent color and filling in 
just dots here and there. A lot of what I'm going to do are dots. That's the next trick on creating something like this where the feathers look very jeweled. A lot of little dots that are clumped and clustered together. You don't want random polka dots everywhere. That won't work. But this yellowy green color, very, very bright. And this is another one that just kind of clashes with that cooler blue that I have in several areas. And it makes it stand out a lot, which gives you that shimmery feel. In addition to that, I'm going to come on top of that with a light green, which is looks more like a grass green would be a good way to, to describe that one. So it's a shade, well, several shades darker. And I will add some detailing on those blue feathers with that. A lot of those little dots all over the place. But again, you want them clumped and clustered together. I'm using the green now I, back onto these lower feathers just to get some highlights with those. And it just stands out so nicely against the cooler blues. And I don't want it to go too crazy with this. I really want this green tone to be where I want that shimmery look, that very iridescent look with the feathers. If I put it everywhere, it's not going to look like that. It's just going to look like a mixture of green and blue. By being very selective on which areas I put that, that makes those feathers look very shimmery. Back to adding details now on these feathers on the back. Now, one thing that I did on this piece that you're, at, you're not really going to see on the video portion, you'll see it on the final photo, the... The curve that goes along the back there, those bright feathers, draw you right off the canvas. More so when you looked at it as a whole right now because of how it's cropped, it's not as obvious. But when you looked at that whole painting, when I backed up from it, it was like that was a huge problem with your eye just being drawn off. So it was an easy solution. I took some of my blues and purples and just toned down those feathers off to the edge. And you'll see that on the very final photo where those are much, much softer, which keeps your attention on the rest of the painting building up more details again. Now, as you can see, when I paint, I jump around a lot. I will get an area to where I feel like it's mostly finished and then let it dry. And then I'll come back to it once I have other areas done. But I kind of jump around quite a bit. And with that liner brush, just coming around those edges, brightening that up, I'm using the unbleached titanium white there for these highlights. And this is another area, like I was saying, my, my photo or my reference photo, I'm not copying that exact. I just need to go for close. The things on here that are important that they're exact, I need the eye in the right place. I need the beak, the head, all of that needs to be shaped right, my general outline of the bird. But each individual feather, that really doesn't have to be exact. I have to be close. I need to go in the right direction. I need each brush stroke to be about the right length. That sort of thing matters. But I don't need everyone to be exact, exact. More highlights there with that unbleached titanium white. That is a color I use more than just about any other. I use it for everything. Taking some of this cooler blue, it's almost a periwinkle blue and adding some highlights around the bird that way too, on all of the blue feathers really. But again, in selective areas, in clumps and clusters, if I put it everywhere, then it just ends up being too solid. I just want that for some of the highlights. This is where I'm taking that orange that I was talking about that is very, very translucent and I used to think I hated. And the more I'm using it for glazing, it's one of my favorites for glazing. If I need an orange that I'm gonna glaze, that's the one that I go for now. And these shadows, it looks like it's black on the video, but when you see it in person, the way that the light refracts through all of these layers, it's a much richer tone than had I used the flat black. And I've got that along the outside or back of the bird's neck, under his jaw, and then on the shadows of a lot of these feathers. Here's that purple blue again. It's not straight purple. There's actually blue mixed in with it. When you compare that right up against those green tones, this starts really creating that very shimmery look. I need some highlights here that I realized when I backed away from the painting, that little clump was just too dark. So I came back through with some more highlights. 
It's really important when you're painting to continuously back away from the piece because when you look at it at a distance, you'll notice things that you didn't notice when you were sitting right up close to it. You can also take a photo with your cell phone so that you're looking at it on a small screen or smaller screen. That can help too. And this is really the stage where the majority of the work is done. I am just going to continuously back away from the painting and make different adjustments. One big thing that I realized I was missing, and I only got part of it on video, but the neck, the front of the neck, didn't have enough of a highlight. And while what I have now is very close to my reference photo, it didn't stand out enough for my piece. And so that's where you have to step away from the reference photo and start focusing on what your painting needs in order to make it a stronger piece. And in this case, I came back through with a highlight along the back or the blue por portions of the feather of the back and then along the front of the neck. And that really helped guide the eye down the painting a little bit more because it was going straight from the beak, eye, and then the, the feathers on the back. It just kind of took you in a straight line. So by pulling highlights along the front of the bird's neck and on the back, it gave it a much nicer flow. And that was something that was way different from my reference photo. So it's not just that I oversaturated colors on the beak and everywhere else, I also want to watch what, what areas may need to be lighter or darker in order to make my painting a stronger piece. And there's some of the highlight along the back I was talking about there. few more details here and then as we switch into that final photo you can see the highlight that I'm talking about on the front of the neck those little changes really made a big difference in having the overall flow be what I needed it to be to just draw your eye from the beak kind of down the neck and then back up the back before your eye was being drawn straight across from beak eye neck because I didn't have that highlight at all there so this is much more pleasing to the eye when you stand back having added that highlight even though it wasn't on the reference photo so when you are using reference photos don't feel like you have to copy everything exact go for what's going to make your piece a better painting once my painting was completely dry, I applied a very light coat of Canvar varnish. The reason that I apply this before the varnish that I'm going to paint on is sometimes that Liquitex varnish, I've had it smudge the work underneath just a bit, especially areas that have been airbrushed. So by putting that spray varnish on, it just avoids any problems for me. I use this sponge brush to actually apply the varnish or spread it around, I should say, because I typically just squirt the varnish right onto the canvas. I don't know that that's the best practice. It's just what I always do. Now, you do want a very light coat. You don't want to use too much. I probably used a little more than what I needed to for this. Keep it very, very light because you can have problems where it gets foggy or causes different issues. Even here, it looks a little bit foggy. Once it dries, it won't be at all. But you also don't want to overbrush it. Just brush it around and then stop. Don't keep trying to blend and blend and blend. You, again, can cause a sort of foggy, not very pleasant end result. So just quickly go over everything with it and then let let that dry completely. You want to let it dry for a minimum of three hours before you apply your second coat. And once dry, I've got a nice even gloss over everything. And for me, once I varnish things, I can't tell what are oil paints versus acrylic paints. In many cases, I have to go and look back up on my own work. My oils and my acrylics look exactly the same once my acrylics are varnished. But it gives it just a really, really nice sheen. You can also get those varnishes with a matte finish. So if you don't like gloss, that is an option for you. These varnishes make the painting look like it's wet paint again. That's a complaint I often hear from people that they don't like the Liquitex Basics or any of the paints that have a more matte finish. Once you put a gloss varnish over it, the paint looks wet again, so the colors look like they did when you initially applied them. Hey, have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round, has an orange arrow going to it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. When I'm healthy, there's five a week. Not right now. Soon though. Soon hopefully I'll be back to posting five new art videos every single week. And I've got some really cool product reviews coming up. My favorite pencil sharpener right now. I've got a new light box I'm going to be reviewing. So there's some good stuff coming.